Well, good evening and welcome to yet another virtual speakeasy event. My name is Jay Berseth. I'm development director for the nonpartisan and nonprofit Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. Past editions of our speakeasy event series has a, have explored Fox Con's entrance into the state, disinformation in the age of the coronavirus, and the impact of reporting on the pandemic by former Wisconsin Watch interns and fellows around the world. Before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit about who we are, and then I'll introduce our speakers for the evening. The center was founded in 2009. We publish independent investigative journalism as Wisconsin Watch and train the next generation of investigative journalists. You can find our stories on our website, wisconsinwatch.org, and in newspapers, online news sites, on the radio, and on TV around the state as we give away our stories for free to other news organizations. If you want to follow our work, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where our handle is at Wisconsin Watch or visit wisconsinwatch.org slash subscribe to sign up for our free email newsletters, including daily Wisconsin coronavirus updates with curated news from around the state. We don't publish, we, we don't have a subscriber paywall and uh, don't accept advertising dollars. So we rely on the support of people like you to fund our work. If you find value in trustworthy nonpartisan news, please consider becoming a member by donating any amount um, at wisconsinwatch.org slash donate. Now through the end of the year news match and generous members of our watchdog club are giving $75,000 to include, in, encourage you to match this amount. Your contribution today will be doubled by news match. Again, if you'd like to make a contribution to directly support our reporting, you can do so by going to wisconsinwatch.org slash donate. And thank you to all of our donors and members of the Watchdog Club and Leadership Circle who make everything that we do possible. Tonight's speakeasy event titled Behind Wisconsin's Election Numbers, What Just Happened? is led by our co-founder and manage, managing editor, D.J. Hall, who is joined by special guest, Jennifer Epps Addison, Wisconsin Watch reporter, Vanessa Swales, and Wisconsin Watch and Vote Beat reporters, Nora Eckert and Anya Van Weidendonk. This spirited discussion will focus on the outcomes in Wisconsin during the 2020 presidential election, including how voter turnout compared to the 2016 presidential election and the, ef the effect of rampant misinformation about voter fraud on social media. At the end of this discussion, we will open it up for a question and answer period. If you'd like to ask a question, please type it in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We'll ask that you keep your microphone muted throughout this discussion. And now to introduce our guests and lead the discussion, Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism Managing Editor, editor and co-founder, DJ Hall. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Uh, ni nice to see all of you here. Uh, thanks a lot for giving up some, uh, some of your evening to join us. Um, so I wanted to introduce the reporters who'll be talking tonight and then our special guest. Uh, first of all, Nora Eckert joined Wisconsin Watch in mid-October after a stint as an investigative reporting intern and audio reporting intern on the audio team of the uh, Wall Street Journal. She's a Wisconsin native and earned a master's degree in journalism from the University of Maryland in 2019. So Nora, I don't know if you're on everybody's screen, you can wave. Vanessa Swales came to us this summer after completing a one-year reporting fellowship uh, with the New York Times. She received a master's degree in journalism from the Craig Newmark's Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. And the uh, Anya von Wagdendonk hit the ground running a week before the November 3rd election after moving from Muskegon, Michigan, where she covered government business and environmental issues for M, M Live and Mus the Muskegon Chronicle. She is a 2019 graduate of the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. And if that sounds familiar, that's because she and Vanessa were classmates. So our, our special guest tonight is Jennifer Epps Addison. She's a Wisconsin native who now leads the New York-based Center for Popular Democracy. 
CPD was active in the get out the vote efforts in Milwaukee ahead of no the no November 3rd election. It operates on the philosophy of building the quote, power of communities to ensure the country embodies our vision of an inclusive, equitable society. So I'm gonna start out asking Nora and Anya. So we sent you guys out on November 3rd to see how voting was going. Anya, talk a bit about where you went and who you talked to. Yeah, um, so I kind of zigzagged all over the city, um, starting at about 6.30 that morning. Um, and I began my day uh, on the south side. Um, so I hit up uh, three different polling sites down there. Um, and things were, you know, we didn't quite know what to expect, I think, going in, whether there would be long lines, whether um, there would be sort of some of these issues. And um, really to start, um, I didn't see much except just sort of, a, it was a beautiful day. So people just seemed to be in a really great mood. Um, hitting up the polls. Um, I spoke to some poll workers um, at Hayes Bilingual down there um, who talked about sort of minor issues. Um, so for example, um, if you have a, a dual last name and you're registered with one last name, you have to sort of re-register on the spot. So little things like that, but nothing sort of problematic. Um, I also saw, you know, uh, lots of community groups volunteering in order to hand out water, hand out PPE, masks, hand sanitizer. Um, so people just really kind of getting involved. Um, a couple of those volunteers told me, you know, it was their first time getting involved in the election, first time maybe even getting involved in sort of community service work in general. Um, and so that sort of, that energy, I definitely saw at all the poll sites. Um, I briefly went over to West Allis, um, and that was the only place I saw a line all day. There was about a 30 minute line um, outside of a school there. Um, but yeah, I mean, things seem to sort of be flowing and there seemed to be this sort of strong energy. Um, and then in the evening, I headed over to the north side and went to a number of polling places there. Um, sort of expecting a little bit more um, activity. Um, I was told that, you know, that window, that sort of uh, post-work pre-dinner window is often when there's a large surge. Um, and I didn't quite experience that, I didn't quite see that. Um, but one thing that I did encounter up there um, at I believe a Metcalf Park polling place, um, there were a number of young activists from the organizing group block um, who had sort of, they'd been out all day, they'd been, singing and holding up signs and handing out um, t-shirts and masks and just sort of, um, again, creating that, that joyous spirit that was going on. Um, and they had been uh, accused of electioneering and I believe they said they spent something like three hours kind of trying to um, get back to what they were trying to do. And so that was kind of the big hiccup that I heard about and that I encountered. Um, but by the time I got there at five, they were still there, they were still hanging out, um, they were still handing out um, their swag. So yeah, and then uh, I was back down to Central Cap by about eight o'clock when they, you know, announced when they would be announcing the totals, which was going to be four a.m. So uh, Nora, could you talk about where you went and who you talked to during uh, or on election day? Yeah, so like Anya, I um, I hit the polls in uh, on north side of Milwaukee when they opened and a beautiful day, as she said, there weren't any lines really, or if there were lines, they were resolved in a, a few minutes, which was, I think, good to see for the voters who were waiting outside. And I started off uh, shadowing an advocacy group called Common Ground, and they were helping out voters who needed help with curbside voting. Um, or had issues with uh, bringing proper documentation for their registration. And that was eye-opening for me because I didn't understand how much depended on groups like that just showing up and being outside. So it was really great to see that work in action. Um, the woman I was shadowing actually got a call um, from a voter who wasn't allowed to vote. And it was a mistake by the poll worker she said that she needed to bring in her absentee ballot in order to vote, um, but she hadn't mailed it in. So that was a mistake and they actually called a lawyer and got that woman to vote. And it was really amazing seeing that in action. Um, so everything in Milwaukee was pretty smooth that I saw. The highlight of my time there was uh, I ran into a group of nuns who were doling out blessings and candy to voters, which I think was what everyone needed on election day. They were clad in these lime green shirts. So that was really great to see. 
And then I drove over to the Fox Valley for um, my afternoon and early evening. And I was there because in Outagamie County, they had a ballot printing error, just the size of a, uh, a finger, a fingernail, the width of a fingernail that actually prevented around 13,500 ballots from being processed by tabulating machines. Um, it's amazing to see how finicky uh, that software is. So I went over there to see how clerks and election officials were handling that. And what the Outagamie County ruled was that they had to hand copy those ballots over. And it was a real toss up because these folks aren't allowed to open up ballots until election day. So they don't know if they're going to have thousands of ballots to hand copy or 10 or none. So uh, I just checked in with, the, I think four different polling places in Grand Chute and Appleton and saw a really mixed bag down there. Um, there were some folks that were done hand copying their ballots by four o'clock and were kind of yawning and sending sending workers home. And there were some that were just completely slammed and trying to help in-person voters and trying to facilitate the things they need to on election day while also scrambling to hand copy ballots when they popped up. So that was that was a little bit of a fiasco, but I, it sounds like everything was resolved and they weren't there too late. And then I headed back to Milwaukee uh, and stopped in at Central Count at the end of the day around midnight to check in on the workers there. And when I was leaving Central Count, uh, a, a worker was in the elevator with me and told me she had been there since 6 a.m. And it was 1 a.m. when we were leaving. So just really amazing to see the dedication of all the election workers that showed up in the state. And you also did a story before the election about curing your ballot since we're not a until this year, uh, Wisconsin hasn't been a heavily absentee ballot uh, focused state. What is curing your ballot? What did you find out? Yeah, a lot of us are new to absentee voting. So there are mistakes that are going to happen. And previous reporting that uh, Wisconsin Watch did uh, found that April saw a lot of those errors. But thankfully, it seems like we saw a few errors in this election. People seem to be getting acquainted with the process. And it's really a quite simple thing what you need to fill in on the envelope of the ballot. It's signing your name, having a witness signature and a witness address, but some of those can fall through the cracks. And I talked with a, um, an official, a government official actually in Racine, who was flabbergasted when her ballot was rejected. She thought there was some mistake, but it turns out that in her excitement at filling out her ballot and chatting about the referendum on it, uh, she neglected to ask her witness to put his signature or his address down, it was his address. So it's very easy for these things to happen. And luckily in Wisconsin, we do have a curing process. Uh, clerks aren't required to call voters if they do have a mistake on their ballot, but it's widely practiced across the state. So we, uh, we did a data request for the voters whose ballots had been rejected and called a bunch of those folks, emailed a bunch of those folks and some, some people, it was the first time they heard that their ballot had been rejected. But again, this was weeks before the election. So by the time that that day hit, hopefully those, those people had the chance to resolve those errors. And it can be quite an easy process, as simple as just bringing your ballot in, signing it in front of the clerk. Or if you decide to vote in person, just bringing your absentee ballot in, spoiling it and casting an in-person ballot. So the other story that you worked on pre-election was about drop boxes again, because we haven't had a lot of absentee voting in previous years. The idea of having a drop box was just not that big of a deal, but this year uh, it became a thing. Tell a little bit about what happened with drop boxes and, and some of the hiccups that came with that. Yeah, we, we had um, hundreds of drop boxes across the state and it, uh, this story afforded me the chance to talk to the mayor from my hometown, which was really great, Wausau, Wisconsin. And she said that the minute that she got her federal funding uh, for coronavirus relief, one of the first things they did is went out and purchased this huge ballot box that could hold 3000 ballots and was bolted down in front of city hall. And I found that a lot of areas across the state did that. And uh, there was really these massive pushes to educate voters on where those were and which ones you could and couldn't use. And this was the snag that we saw in the story is voters would um, maybe be doing errands in a town that they didn't live in. Say they live in Cudahy, but they were driving into Milwaukee to go shopping. 
they would drop off their ballot in Milwaukee when they should be dropping it off in their own municipalities drop box. So that created a bit of a headache for the clerks, but thankfully the voters don't have to get involved. They just sort of have to ship the ballots around. But we found that drop boxes were a really nice medium for voters. Um, it, it afforded them a bit more sense of security than if they dropped their ballot in the mail because a lot of the voters I talked to were very nervous about how the Postal Service was handling operations during the election and kind of felt like they were throwing it into the ether if they mailed it in. And a lot of the people I talked to were also at risk populations and just didn't feel comfortable casting their ballot in person on election day and risking um, being in contact with someone who had COVID. So this was a really comfortable way for them to have a sense of ceremony going to drop it off in the drop box, but um, thinking that their ball their ballots going into safe hands from the start. So uh, Anya, you and Nora also did a story uh, letting voters know what to expect on November 3rd. Uh, how does that story hold up now that November 3rd is gone? What are the things that uh, people warned about? What came to pass? What, how would you characterize the way it turned out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that we sort of tried to present all possible scenarios of what people could expect at the polls, um, both in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic and then also in terms of this kind of particularly fraught political moment that we're in. Um, and so we talked about COVID precautions. Obviously, um, there were there was uh, hand sanitizer available. There was social distancing. Um, well enforced. Um, all uh, poll workers were behind uh, plexiglass screens. Um, I saw, you know, many volunteers. Every time a person voted, a volunteer would show up to wipe down the voting booth, wiping down doors, handles. Um, everyone was in masks. There was mask enforcement. So on that level, um, our kind of predictions of what would be enforced there um, was accurate. Some of the kind of more, I think, um, intense things that we warned about in terms of potential police presence, guns at the polls, um, militia presence. Um, so we talked about um, guns might be um, permitted, open carry um, might be permitted depending on the municipality and depending on the polling location. Um, shortly before election day, um, Milwaukee sort of announced that um, guns would not be permitted at any Milwaukee polling place. But um, it was, I believe, sort of um, up to other municipalities' discretion in non-school polling locations. Um, there was no reports of um, militia presence. Um, there were, you know, we talked about uh, the National Guard would be present as poll workers, but in plain clothes um, for sort of fear of potential intimidation. Um, and then I guess the other sort of big question on a lot of people's minds was, the role of election observers, um, both, um, you know, Donald Trump had called for his supporters to act as election observers. And I think that there was some concern um, that observers can kind of walk this fine line between legal observing, which is protected, you know, by the state, um, and again, presenting an intimidating um, presence. Um, and so there weren't reports uh, at the polling sites that I heard of, of um, intimidation. Most of the election observers I saw were, you know, young people just kind of hanging out. Um, and, uh, you know, they can be par partisan, they can be nonpartisan. The one sort of report that I heard was um, at Central Count. Um, early on, I believe there was something of a sort of, um, some aggressive elections observers um, who were escorted out. Um, and there was one gentleman there with binoculars um, and it was determined that the binoculars were kosher. Um, and so that was the one sort of um, time that I think the election commission had to get involved and decide whether it was okay for this gentleman to maybe be peering at people's absentee ballots. <laughs> um, yeah, so nothing, thank God, uh, nothing, you know, the worst case scenarios that we talked about um, came to pass. Great, thank you. Um, so Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about the Center for Popular Democracy? What are its goals? Who funds it? What do you do? Especially when it comes to the election space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's really fun to be in discussion about my home state and uh, you know, especially considering all of the circumstances. Um, Center for Popular Democracy and CPD Action, which is our political arm. I'm sorry, that's my daughter singing. Hold on a second. So sorry. 
I have a show kid, a, 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 a theater kid in the house, so you never know what's going to come out of her room. Um, anyway, the Center for Popular Democracy and CPD Action, which is our political arm, we are a national network of grassroots community organizations in 35 states, Puerto Rico and Washington, DC. We work with communities all across the country to help build the country of our dreams. It's our belief that people in this country don't deserve just to merely survive, just to squeak by, just to make ends meet. We actually all deserve to have the freedom to thrive and to have government and institutions that invest in our people and in our lives. Um, and so that's the work that we do. We are partnered with Black Leaders Organizing Communities and Leaders Igniting Transformation in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, but really, you know, just to think about this election, uh, you know, three and a half years ago, we began to look at the research and to understand voting patterns and to think about, um, you know, what would it take to have sort of um, seed change in this country? Um, you know, what would the 2020 election look like? And in particular, um, you know, how did we, how could we engage uh, communities of color, Black and Latinx communities, especially to make sure that they have um, a real say and high participation um, in the election. We also knew because we had seen under previous Governor Walker and others, a, a you know, host of voter suppression activities, passages of laws intended at reducing um, people's ability to participate, that 2020 would be an onslaught of intimidation, suppression, and um, misinformation. And so we knew we needed to be really particular about the communities we engaged. So we built a seven state plan. Wisconsin was a part of that plan. Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Florida, Arizona, and Georgia. Um, and we, you know, we identified these both as the seven states that would be the sort of decision makers in the 2020 election. But I think more importantly for us, when we looked at the numbers, we realized that we could change the outcome in each of these states uh, without changing a single white person's vote from 2016 to 2020. Um, and it's not that they, we didn't want to change any votes or we didn't want to engage more white folks, but that we knew that um, communities of color were going to be the primary decision makers in this election. And we focused in on making sure that they would be able to participate. And I'm happy to say that uh, in Wisconsin, as well as in every single one of those states, participation from black and brown communities either remains stable, right? So amidst record suppression, intimidation, um, you know, a pandemic, right? It either remains stable or it increased significantly in the case of Georgia where Atlanta Metro turnout was up 128%. Um, so I think, you know, it really was the focus of these community organizations to make sure people participated. And even with a, um, you know, devastating pandemic, we saw that to bear true in Milwaukee. And then we also saw that with voters um, of color in Dane County, especially sort of Fitchburg, Sun Prairie, um, in Racine, and, and particularly with indigenous communities in La Crosse uh, and in other indigenous areas in the state. And um, you guys were on the ground in Milwaukee, I guess, with your community partners. What, what kind of stuff were, were people doing and what kind of reaction were they getting from folks? Yeah, I mean, I think first, I, I feel like it goes back to Nora's point about um, the election administration. And I, I feel like it's worth noting um, that, you know, Milwaukee has uh, both the youngest and some of the blackest leadership in the country right now. Milwaukee County, uh, County Executive Crawley, a uh, black man under 35, County Board Chairwoman Nicholson, a black woman under 35, um, you know, uh, ca uh, City Council President Johnson, again, a black man under 35, and of course, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, um, you know, under 35, black man. And so, you know, there, there is both a, a sense of, um, you know, having uh, Black representation uh, and leadership at those uh, multi uh, levels cord in coordination with each other had an impact, but also um, I think some of the boldness of, of uh, this younger class of elected officials saying, we see what, you know, we see the attempts to um, make it more difficult for Milwaukeeans to vote. Um, and I think really responded to some of the um, fiascos in the in the primary season, the long lines that were putting people at risk. And in fact, some people did contract COVID from participating, um, you know, in particular uh, confusion about polling places, not having enough polling workers, uh, the closing down of, of voting sites with no notice. 
these are the types of things that they faced in a primary with a very hostile state legislature that made it more difficult for them to uh, address some of these concerns. And they worked really hard. Um, so the voter drop boxes, for example, were not just downtown in Milwaukee, but they were within neighborhoods and they made it easy for folks to be able to drop off ballots. Um, you know, the, uh, they made a very high concerted effort to recruit poll workers to make sure there would be enough polls open and enough workers open. Um, so I think the young leadership had a, a real impact. The other thing I'd, I'd say, um, to going back to Anya's point, is, is that um, groups like Block and Lit uh, scenario plan this election down to every potential outcome in detail. And so as it related to um, making sure people per could participate, you know, they engaged um, more than 200,000 voters. They sent more than a million text messages and phone calls. Um, they really made sure people knew how to participate. And again, given the pandemic, the amount of intimidation um, and some of the real challenges Democrats had speaking to these communities um, who were really struggling, um, I think it was a real, um, you know, real victory on their part. Uh, and, and so the, I think those are the, the main things that I saw is, you know, I'll go back to uh, Anya's story about the, the young man that had been targeted. So at that polling location where they were accused of electioneering, um, the block ambassador was a young man who cannot vote himself because he is still on papers and he's barred by Wisconsin law, but block does not, you know, say, oh, you can't vote, you're not important. You're still a part of that community. And so he became an ambassador to help other people get out and vote. And what he was chanting outside of that polling location was, I can't vote, but you can. Really like in an effort to drag people who maybe hadn't thought about voting that day, but heard his message into the polling location. And we got several people who came into that location simply because of that. Now, this young man was 21 years old. And, and the, the sad truth is the fact is, is that that polling location called the police on him four different times. So officers came to the polling location. Eventually the district attorney's office sent two represent representatives down to his polling location. Now in Wisconsin, that is actually con considered police contact. If he had a bad relationship with his parole officer, it's possible that he could have been revoked for that interaction, for those four interactions. And um, so it really actually put him at risk. But thankfully, because he was well-trained, he knew what the election law was, he was able to articulate it, and he was also able to guard himself and others who wanted to vote. But having police sitting outside a polling location, that's voter suppression and intimidation, certainly you know, risking people's safety as they're trying to help people participate by calling the police multiple times um, is, you know, is, is intimidation. These are the types of things that folks faced, but I think, again, the story here is that this young man at, at 21 years old knew Wisconsin election law better than both the precinct captain as well as uh, the district attorney's office. And that's in itself is sort of a mini miracle of the Wisconsin election. And I will, I will just say electioneering as opposed to uh, prevent people from being too close to the polling place and advocating for a particular candidate, which of course he was not doing. Exactly. Or, or political party. Um, so now, Nora, you did crunch some numbers, and the truth was the Milwaukee, the, the gross number of votes in Milwaukee was pretty flat from 2016. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this is a really complicated picture that I think we're still eager to dig into because we don't know everything yet. But what we did is looked at the um, raw votes in different wards. And um, what I'm hoping to get soon and what we will get soon to complete this picture is the number of voters who registered on election day um, in these wards, because we understand those numbers can be quite high based on what we've seen in previous elections. I believe that at least 10% is the number I saw from the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Um, and also the uh, number of eligible voters per ward, because um, as Wisconsin allows same day registration, that really is the standard we wanna judge turnout by. So with that caveat, we looked at the raw, raw votes and we focused in on wards that had a population of voters, of black voters over 85%. So 85% of voters in these wards were black voters. And looking at all of these wards, we did see a decrease in raw votes cast and about a 12% or excuse me, 10 and a half percent decrease across those wards. So now the real question is looking at why and when we get those other numbers, looking at was that a decrease in turnout or are we seeing real fluctuations in registration? And if that's the picture, what's causing that? 
Um, so we did see a trend as we looked at those wards and we're just trying to figure out, you know, what would have happened and also looking at the efforts of so many groups in those wards, particularly, and Anya can speak to this better than I can, but um, what would that picture have been if those activists weren't there? That's the other thing too, is um, some folks were saying it would have been much worse had, had they not been there, which is you know quite obvious probably. So yes, a lot to come on that front. And that, that leads into my next question. Anya did talk to some folks who were both familiar with the efforts and just generally were familiar with the restrictions that were put on by the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about what the restrictions were and what the idea is in terms of the effect that that had on the voting in Milwaukee? Yeah, so I think um, both Nora and Jennifer actually touched on this, um, that there were, um, sort of barriers in place, both uh, more recent and then also kind of more long-term and systemic um, that seemed to um, affect voters, um, especially, you know, sort of looking at 2016 to 2020 and some of the expectations I think that were placed on Milwaukee voters, um, city of Milwaukee voters, um, and then needing to sort of navigate um, the pandemic and then also some of these um, restrictions um, and so I think, I mean, that was sort of the message that I'd been hearing, um, especially on Saturday, um, there was sort of a victory party downtown. Um, and the general message was a sort of idea of, um, imagine if we hadn't been doing this work, um, what would turnout have looked like given all of these sort of challenges that were, that were being navigated. And I think one of the things that folks told you is that a big part of voter engagement is like literally, <laughs> face to face, and that's not safe during a pandemic, not close contact and door knocking. People don't always want strangers knocking on their front door during a pandemic. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. People we told, uh, we talked to, that you talked to, express that as a potential cause for some people not being engaged or they were engaged in a way that isn't as engaging because it wasn't, it couldn't be face to face. So I think, I think that's so, interesting. Yeah, I mean, so Lit, for example, their whole sort of focus is um, targeting young voters of color. And so their engagement, I think, is already sort of digital first, but they even still had to kind of ramp up and be digital only. Um, and so I think that they were able to really sort of be successful. But they talked about, you know, the, the best strategy is always door to door, no matter whether you're selling something or you're promoting an idea. Um, yeah, and that was just off the table for um, a lot of these groups. I do believe that um, Republican candidates were still continuing to do door knocking, um, some, but um, the Democratic Party officially was not sort of uh, allowing that. And then also um, more left aligned groups were not participating in that. I'd like to hear Jennifer's thoughts on this too, because you guys were on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so again, our goal was to ensure that turnout would be stable or increase, right? And so we take stable as a victory because you know, not just because of the pandemic, but also because of the immense amount of voter suppression and intimidation, right? Um, people were not sure whether or not they would show up to their polling location and be surrounded by white supremacists with guns. They were seeing it happening in other places and people were not sure if it was gonna happen here or not. Um, certainly the murder, Kyle Rittenhouse and, and the murders that took place in Kenosha had a chilling impact on people um, wanting to be in public space and <clears throat> and being concerned about the public space. But let me just even like extrapolate a little further. When we talk about turnout being flat, we um, there, there will be somewhere just over a 6,000 vote increase um, overall in the city of Milwaukee's participation from 2016 to 2020, somewhere around 6,000 votes. Um, Joe Biden carried the state by uh, 20,000 votes, 20,697-ish, you know, around that, right? We're not quite done with our count yet, um, but just over 20,000 votes. And so, you know, 6,000 is a, is a pretty significant portion of, you know, 20,000 votes that sort of like carried the rest of the state. So now I would say that there's another thing, there's a couple other, th other things to note here. So. One is, you know, first let me just uh, preface this by saying, by and large, African Americans were the difference maker in this election. Black women voted for Joe Biden at over 91%, African American males over 80%, and people of color overall, more than two thirds of folks 
um, in Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian communities supported Joe Biden. So when people say that the electorate is deeply divided, I think it's important for us to say white people within the electorate are deeply divided. And in fact, the majority of them voted to support Donald Trump. But overall, um, you know, it, as an electorate and particularly communities of color, we're not deeply divided. Um, you know, we're not even significantly divided in this in this country. Um, but Donald Trump did make gains in every demographic group, every racial demographic group, including black voters. And I think, you know, um, what Anya just pointed out um, that uh, his campaign never took people off of doors, particularly in places like Milwaukee, Detroit and Philadelphia. Um, you know, the issue of criminal justice and, you know, Wisconsin is home to the most incarcerated zip code in the country, 53206. Um, and the issue of criminal justice was very salient, um, especially as people had been rising up in the streets all summer. Uh, what we saw is that uh, um, Donald Trump's campaign spent about $6 million um, specifically on digital ads targeting criminal justice reform. Um, Joe Biden's campaign spent around $8,000. Um, and so this is a really significant issue. And, you know, the, Joe Biden's campaign ceded it to the Trump administration. And what we heard from voters in Milwaukee, and I've heard it from voters in Maryland, I actually heard it from my own brother-in-law, um, is that, you know, a really simple line, which is Joe Biden wrote the crime bill that put me or my cousin away, and Donald Trump passed the First Step Act, and they're coming home. And I heard some variation of that story repeated over and over again as, as um, you know, the small number of black voters and other voters of color that shifted indicated it. So I think our weakness, the Democrats weakness in the ticket was certainly criminal <clears throat> justice reform and immigration. And we saw that play out with um, a shift of, of, you know, somewhat significant shift in black and Latinx votes, although again, those communities overwhelmingly voted for Biden, you could imagine, um, particularly in an election year in which uh, there was not so much outright white sort of nationalism and supremacy coming from the Republican ticket, you could imagine that a, a different Republican candidate could actually make some significant gains focused on both criminal justice and the economy, the two driving for, uh, factors for people who, for black uh, voters who crossed over. And that actually could really, you know, that could flip um, a Wisconsin or a Michigan or a, a Pennsylvania right back. And so th certainly the story to come will be these voters and and will they sort of maintain that loyalty or will the Republicans be able to, you know, you build on what Trump has done and uh, make even more significant gains. Thanks a lot. So we're going to shift gears uh, to talk uh, to Vanessa. She did a story about uh, in, in collaboration with ProPublica about the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Vanessa, first, what role does the Wisconsin Elections Commission play in elections? Sorry, I was struggling with the mute button. Um, so yeah, so the Wisconsin Elections Commission is a, is a partisan um, regulatory agency of the state of Wisconsin, uh, essentially established to administer and enforce election laws in the state. Um, you know, the commission itself is made up of six members, um, two of which are appointed by the governor and um, one each by the Senate majority leader, the Senate minority leader, the Speaker of the Assembly, um, and the Assembly minority leader. Uh, Republicans and Democrats have, you know, three members each. So that's kind of like the quick hit of what is the WEC. And what were you, the major findings of your investigation? What did you find out? Yeah, so I mean, of the, a lot of the actual um, material came from minutes and video recordings um, regarding, you know, what was being said by the commissioners. Um, and one thing that, you know, really stood out is that the commission itself in 2020 has deadlocked 19 times in the 28 meetings that it has had. Um, you know, usually the WEC meets four times a year and that's it. Um, and in the prior four years, the commission deadlocked only five times in total. I mean, that's a ma sharp increase. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really I delved into was looking at one particular reason um, or one of the particular reasons um, was the appointment of Republican donor who 
who promotes unfounded allegations of vote by mail fraud. His name is uh, Robert um, Spindell Jr. And he joined in late 2019. Um, and, you know, of these particular deadlocks, I mean, four, one occurred two weeks prior to the election. Um, and it was sort of mayhem during that meeting, trying to, you know, there was all this worry that they were going to deadlock again, and they inevitably did. And it often happens along party lines. It's often between Democrats and Republicans. Um, and, you know, three major deadlocks that happened in the past year or so um, threw the commission into the national spotlight, um, you know, regarding how to deal with ballots um, with missing or illegible postmarks following the April 2020 primaries, um, whether the Green Party presidential ticket should be allowed on the ballot in August, um, and also in December 2019, so bear in mind this is when Spindell was appointed, um, whether to follow a judge's order to purge a quarter million Wisconsin voters from the rolls. And, you know, the last two issues ended up in court. Um, and it kind of highlighted the sort of the inaction of the WEC and how responsibility essentially was shifted to the courts as well as municipalities. Um, at times, really sowing confusion and delays and inconsistency across the state. Um, so that's you know, generally what the project was about. And I think one of the things you found, like on the postmark issue, for example, we have 1,850 municipal clerks mm -hmm. and they each run their own elections and they each make their own decisions. And what happened was this group was unable to tell them, okay, if it doesn't have a postmark or mm -hmm. if the postmark is kind of smudgy, what do you do? They're like, we just can't decide. And so there was some inconsistency in whose ballots got accepted and which ones got rejected. Yeah. Um, is there is there anything that you see going forward that uh, they might have to tackle that this lack of um, agreement might be might create a problem? I mean, off the top of my head, I can't necessarily think of a, a major issue. I mean, their next scheduled meeting is for December, um, but that doesn't mean like, of course, coming out of the current election, issues are going to consistently crop up. And I'm, I'm sure there will be partisan divide, especially given the results of this election, um, especially given that, you know, it's, it's fair to say at least two of the appointed Republican commissioners um, very much uh, follow, you know, quote unquote, the marching orders of their appointing authorities. Um, and so for me, I, you know, I can't necessarily pinpoint what will be, you know, upcoming issues, but most certainly I can say there will, there will be, um, I think it's inevitable. Right. And of course we, there may be a re recount. We'll yeah. see what happens in the next couple of days. I think that's really an yeah. open question as to whether the Trump campaign will follow through on his uh, request for a recount. The thing that I, think weighs against it is he's going to have to pay in advance. That's the yeah. law in, in Wisconsin is his campaign will have to pony up several million dollars. And if they, you know, for a result that basically with, if you look at past history, recounts have resulted in just a couple hundred votes flipping one way or the other. It's not enough to overcome the 20,000 votes. Um, so thanks. Uh, what I'd like to do now is kick it back to Jay. I see we have a question or two in the chat and I'd love to have you guys fill that uh, chat box up with questions and we'll just stay here until the questions are answered. Um, I'll uh, swing it back to Jay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dee, and thank you everyone who is participating in this. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them into the the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We have one question so far from Carol. Um, and Carol asks, and I, I think this is probably a, a good question for, for Jennifer in particular, but if anyone else wants to chime in, feel free. Um, Carol asks, how much impact did the work of Stacey Abrams have in getting out the vote in Wisconsin and the other targeted states? Um, and I think kind of on top of this, um, what sort of the, the strategy and tactics and um, efforts uh, 
kind of replicating Stacey Abrams' work in Georgia? You know, how was that done in Wisconsin generally and Milwaukee in particular? Yeah, thank you. What's well, such a great question. And I'm always happy to give Stacey Abrams a shout out. She is incredible and amazing and deserves an immense amount of credit and effort. Um, but I will say that it, there's a spectrum of Black women who um, you know, put together programs that had a huge impact in Wisconsin and other places. You know, Latasha Brown from Black Voters Matter, obviously, you know, N.C. Afoot, who is the director of the New Georgia Project, which was founded by Stacey uh, in Georgia, Amy Allison from She the People, uh, uh, Dewana Thompson from Woke Vote, and, you know, Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors and Opal Tometi, who are the founders of Black Lives Matter. I mean, the list really goes on and on, and each one of them ran um, incredibly aligned programs to grassroots organizations on the ground, helping to both raise the profile, increase the number of people that they could engage and talk to, um, and, you know, sort of like make voting the thing, right? Um, but I think one thing that I want to say is, um, you know, this election really, like, it was record breaking on, on all sides, right? That I think Stacey Abrams' strategy um, is that the largest group, uh, like the largest voting block in this country is non-voters, right? And so we spend a lot of our political imagination trying to figure out how to sway a really small su subset of what we imagine to be swing voters. And we could be either party, right? Um, but people spend a real lot of energy on the small subset of voters when the reality is, is that the largest voting block are people who don't vote. And so that was Stacey Abrams' strategy in Georgia, um, register everybody who is eligible, make sure every eligible voter has the tools they need and guard every vote once it gets cast. And um, that was sort of a part of the national playbook that we all had uh, working with these groups on the ground. And so I think that's really what it is. And it's the same thing in Wisconsin and rec you know, pretty high turnout um, coming from all sides. And, and that is actually really good. When people then respect election results, <laughs> um, that is actually a really good thing, right? When we're all participating. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. I'm gonna start with Gills. Uh, he and his wife voted at uh, Democracy in the Park and they were responsible for taking the ballots to the city clerk. Um, he asked what impact, if any, could challenges to the democracy in the park ballots have? I can take that one that my best guess is that it's not gonna work, um, uh, the challenges that is. And, and the reason I say that is because the city attorney in Madison used to be the top election attorney for the state of Wisconsin for many years. And uh, he knows his law. Um, and the, you know what they were doing there was very carefully crafted people were handing in ballots. They were like, it's almost like a human drop box situation. Um, they were not getting ballots there, which would be in-person absentee voting, which has been limited by the legislature to two weeks prior to the election. These, this happened more than that, more than a month before the election. Um, and so I don't, I, I would be very surprised if any legal challenges are successful in that regard. That that would be my take on it. But of course, that's predicting the future, and who knows what's going to happen. But I, it seems legally they they really uh, nailed it down. I think, um, and it maybe maybe found. I, I don't know if you'd call it a loophole, but they figured out a way to get people's ballots and and not constitute in person absentee balloting. Great, thank you, Dee. A uh, quick question from Gail, um, and this is to anyone who might know the answer. Um, do you know the percentage of people who voted absentee versus the percentage who voted in person? Somebody who's better at math <laughs> than me should go, but we had almost 3.3 million ballots and just under 2 million were uh, in-person absentee and mail-in ballots. That's my recollection. Whatever that is, it sounds like almost two-thirds of the ballots were absentee, but maybe. Um, actually, Karen chimed in and she said 79% absentee. So uh, nearly 80%, nearly four and five ballots were absentee this year. This According to, to, to so Karen. I to journalism. 
Um, Karen also asks, um, you know, do you see, because Trump could um, challenge, the Trump campaign could ask for recounts in some counties and not others, um, do you see any percentage for Trump not in going after overturning the outcome, but rather just making Dane and Milwaukee counties look bad by going over absentee ballots with a fine tooth comb? What's the sort of what's the likelihood that the um, Trump campaign will pivot to uh, making the the more democratic leaning counties look bad rather than winning the election? Well, I mean, it's hard to imagine that the campaign could say anything worse about, uh, you know, big cities, Milwaukee, Detroit, uh, Philadelphia, anything worse than he has already said, um, no matter what the outcome of some of these efforts of his are, you know, he's already said the worst, he's already insinuated that majority people of color, um, you know, cities are theft, you know, are full of theft and crime and, and a whole host of other things. And so, um, you know, the reality is, is as Dee said, uh, these recon efforts may shift, a, you know, at most a few hundred uh, votes. It will certainly not, um, you know, have the impact of changing the electoral outcome. And, you know, again, for folks who are worried about kind of the Supreme Court um, in, in its current constitution, you know, I think what we experienced in Florida came down to a single set of counties, you know, 500 votes in one state um, that would have that was determinative of the outcome. That is not the case here. Um, the uh, former, you know, the, I'm going to say the former president, right, will would need to um, be successful, you know, in uh, essentially four out of five states in multiple versions of different lawsuits within each of those states in order to try to um, overcome the barrier or the challenge that he's got. Um, and it's unlikely to happen. What we've seen so far, for example, in Nevada is that the, of the um, four suits that have been filed, they found um, in the attorney general's favor and against the Trump campaign all four times thus far. So I think it's just really unlike, like the, I think you hit it on the head. The administration's goal right now is to sort of undermine the election results and provide the president with a way to leave office while saving face. Um, but it is unlikely that any of the challenges will will be ultimately be successful. And for those of people who are worried about are we in the sort of early stages of a coup, I think you know this doesn't bear out what we've seen in terms of Latin American coups that were really constructed either by um, sort of capitalist forces or military forces against a democratically elected um, president. Um, and certainly, you know, world world leaders like uh, you know. Boris Johnson, for example, um, congratulating Vice President-elect, the Prime Minister of, of, of Israel, et cetera, Trump allies essentially um, congratulating President-elect Biden um, seems to lend itself to the idea that we're not witnessing a coup, um, at least how we've seen them constructed before here in the United States. Um, and Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Jay. Just one thing yeah. I wanted to briefly bring up too is that in Milwaukee, and, and Howard has been reporting on this more than or I have, but we've seen so much disinformation around that 4 a.m. ballot drop just because the, um, the central count facility in Milwaukee processes all of the city's absentee ballots. And as you can imagine, that's a sizable number. And then they were all released at 4 a.m. when the count was done. And um, if you watched uh, President Trump's press conference the, on election night, he said, I don't want anyone finding ballots at 4 a.m. And of course, in Milwaukee, that's exactly what happened. But they didn't find ballots. They counted ballots. And um, this is something that the Milwaukee Election Commission had been warning folks about for weeks that we'd see this spike late in the night because we aren't allowed to start counting ballots until that day. So um, there's already been a huge push to discredit the results in the Milwaukee area. And um, so, you know, we've, we've seen that in action. And I think that, you know, the damage has been done there um, among folks who, who bought into it. This next question is uh, not so much about the, um, you know, the logistics of the election, but rather about campaigns and campaign marketing, really. Um, 
it's it's about the northern and the rural areas of Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin farmers may have suffered more bankruptcies than anywhere else in the country. Why did people in the red areas of Wisconsin double down and give Trump more votes than in 2016? What was the appeal? And this is kind of open to anyone that feels- um, I'd like to hear Jennifer's thoughts on this because our, our entire focus of our coverage has really been on election administration and we haven't really gotten into the political part of it much at all. Um, and so I'm sure if people who get out the vote understand what the strengths are of the other side, what would you say, how would you answer that one if you, if you have an idea on that one, Jennifer? Um, so I'm going to I'm going to give separate this into two parts, which is what I think is happening now and then what I think we need to do to change it. So, you know, I think what is happening now is that, you know, our analysis was that white folks, by and large, were not going to change their votes from 2016. And that analysis bore out, despite the fact that the Biden campaign put a lot of resources that along with the Lincoln Project and others in trying to convert rural and um, you know working class white folks um, either back to kind of Obama numbers or um, you know away from the Republican Party uh, that just that strategy just didn't bear out um, by and large and, and we didn't believe that it would um, you know I think that there's a few things at play one is people talk about economic interests um, and I think that that's important but I don't think that the Democrats were offering, um, particularly in this election, but in previous elections either, uh, a, an economic vision that um, was well rooted in what, you know, sort of the lower 40% of income earners in this country um, were struggling with. And, I'll, and I say that to say that, you know, there, there was a lot of um, messaging from Democrats that made Trump the, the, the centerpiece of all, all that is wrong in the world. And if you are a part of the 40% of this country who was struggling before Trump, if you lost your home, for example, in 08 or 09 or 2010, and, <clears throat> excuse me, under President Obama um, and watched him bail out banks and, and yet you got no relief, right? If you are a part of the sort of union class of workers who have seen your jobs decline, maybe you are now making actually effectively less than when you started at your factory in 1970s, right? You trace that directly back to Bill Clinton and NAFTA. Um, and so, you know, the reality is that, you know, yes, race plays a significant role in this. And there will always be somewhere between, I think, 30 to 40% of voters, white voters in this country, in which race is the primary driver of their decision, right? Um, but I think there is a, a significant portion of, of what we call the, the Ascension Whites, right? Like white folks who are truly struggling, people in rural counties, in particular, of those who have been hard hit by the opioid crisis, um, you know, of folks who are really struggling. And in, in this election, um, the Democrats did not do a great job of offering them an alternative vision, what the economy would look like under Joe Biden. Um, how Joe Biden would deal with coronavirus differently. You have to remember that the Democrats control the House, but the bill they put before in the, you know, before the Senate did not have monthly uh, guaranteed income for American workers, did not have payroll protection um, to keep people on payrolls and keep their health care. It didn't have a cancellation of rent um, to prevent mass evictions. So there's a lot of things that the, a lot of ground that the Democrats left on the table um, which could have spoken to many of these communities, including rural white communities that are struggling. Um, and I think that is a, a, you know, again, if there were not such a firebrand Republican candidate um, and, you know, somebody who was a little more, uh, a little less distasteful were at the top of the ticket using the same types of strategies that the Trump campaign implemented, we could have very easily, you know, narrowly, but still very easily seen Wisconsin go the other way. Um, I believe you just touched on this a bit, Jennifer, but I want to ask the question. Um, at one point, you were the executive director of Wisconsin Jobs Now. Ah, oh, somebody you... knows me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, this is a question from Sharon. Do you have any sense of whether workers supported Biden in large numbers? Yeah. 
Um, so, uh, you know, this is an exciting thing to say, which is that uh, working class folks, folks making less than $50,000 a year, um, actually turned and um, supported Biden at a higher number, right? Turned out higher for Biden in this election, um, which we all kind of feel good about. But again, I think it really is, you know, I, I hate to be the one who's always putting this drumbeat back, but I think you do really have to extrapolate race. Um, because when you um, separate race and you ask how um, working class voters voted by race, you find that an overwhelming, uh, you know, majority of working class white voters voted for, pre uh, for Donald Trump, uh, an overwhelming majority, um, you know, higher than 80% of working class voters of color um, voted for Joe Biden. And so Again, I think we we see class sort of as a as a important distinction distinctive category that determines um, you know voting patterns. I think by and large, uh, black millionaires voted the same way that black folks who you know are um, you know without a job voted uh, largely, um, and that's important to note. Um, but I will say that this issue is, is critically salient. The, what Donald Trump said two days after election day in one of his speeches is that the Democratic Party is now the party of the tech industry elites and Hollywood elites and uh, coastal elites and the Republican Party is the party of the working class. Um, and you know, I think that uh, while we can again sort of debate that and extrapolate data and which working class are we talking about, the bottom line sentiment that um, you know we've lost touch, and that we're too deeply you know that that political parties are too deeply controlled by corporate interests, and that they have lost lost touch with the people who are struggling in communities. I think is real, and it has real disastrous impacts for our democracy, particularly um, moving into this next um, administration. If we are unable to deal with some of these big economic issues and, and, and we're going into what could become a Great Depression, depending on how Congress you know, responds to it, um, I think you know, it is cause for concern that without dealing with that, we could be setting ourselves up in 2024 for the, the rise of a more competent authoritarian um, sort of authoritarianist re regime. And that could be really you know, a real big challenge for democracy and democratic participation. Staying on um, voter engagement and voter turnout and, um, you know, par uh, participation in elections. Um, for Jennifer and anyone who would like to weigh in, this comes from Andy. Uh, it appears that turnout in Milwaukee, in Black Milwaukee precincts declined about 10% in 2020 compared to 2016. Uh, based on early analysis, uh, what happened to Black turnout rates in other major cities? And if the Milwaukee rate is lower, uh, what would explain that and what could be done to increase it in future elections? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think it's it's more complicated than um, just sort of stating the rate decline. There are a couple of things. First of all, for those of you who have knocked doors in Milwaukee, you will notice, especially as you get into um, uh, neighborhoods with a density of, of Black residents over 90%, um, you will notice a lot of abandoned houses. You will notice a lot of houses that are missing that have been raised. Um, and so, and, and this happens literally from month to month you know, in elections, meaning that if you went and knocked doors in April, you could walk that same block and there may be two or more houses that no longer exist or no longer have residents in it. And so it's really hard for us, given, like given the rate of eviction, Milwaukee is one of the highest eviction um, cities in the country, given the instability of the economy um, and, you know, a, a number of other forces, a, you know, mass incarceration and a whole bunch of other things. It's really hard to, for, first of all, understand what the stable population number is and what the correct sort of eligible voter versus, re, you know, registered. So I think Nora's right to wait till we get those in, in you know, in-person registrations to get a fuller picture. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is, again, now these same neighborhoods, you know, 90% black or higher voted at a rate of 95% for Joe Biden. So I do not want to overplay this. I know Trump will do that. I'm not doing his job for him. But 
we did see a significant increase in voters for Trump in some of these neighborhoods. And again, I really think criminal justice was at the heart of this. It's something that the Democratic Party will have to, I think, contend with, that Wisconsin Democrats are certainly um, you know, in the throes of trying to address and try to figure out right now. Um, you know, there is a, a movement that is asking why do we spend trillions of dollars in, you know, on policing and criminalization and yet there's no money for education or housing or healthcare or, or any of the things our people need. Um, and, you know, the Republican Party, you know, is not, is not widely embracing that message, but what they are doing is, is finding specific, specific and targeted ways to wedge that issue, like the First Step Act, for example, um, for our communities. And so I think the Democrats, the strategy that Joe Biden had, which was to just not talk about it, to just not respond, uh, was not a winning strategy. It didn't, uh, it didn't appease or put at ease white voters where, you know, where policing was a major motivating force. And it also um, did not, uh, uh, you know, it, it cost him votes in the African American community. And it had that been that number been um, around 26% instead of 18%, we could be looking at um, a different administration incoming, right? So I think that's important to know. But yeah, so I would say the number again, for us, stable, right, flat, that is victory, because of all of the things that I just mentioned. And then yes, there are places where we really did see you know, Dane County is a place where we saw people of color voting increase in, in, in significant numbers, particularly Fitchburg. Um, you know, also uh, the indigenous, res uh, the Ho-Chunk Nation, um, their voter participation skyrocketed. Um, you know, Arizona is a really interesting place. That if you look at, um, if you take an overlay of democratic participation and you over, uh, which, you know, won the state and you overlay it with the Navajo and other indigenous tribal communities, it's literally almost like a perfect overlay. Um, and then of course, you know, in Atlanta, voter participation in the um, Atlanta metro area was up over 128%. Um, and so, you know, this is a place where we saw, again, with unique um, sort of voter outreach, they had a souls on the polls, which was engagement of the adult entertainment industry in Atlanta, which is a major um, you know, segment of the population. They also had Twitch the Vote. Twitch is an online gaming platform, the largest online gaming platform in the, in the world. Um, gamers represent a potential you know, entirely new voting block and more than half of gamers are women and people of color. And so they did a very intentional outreach to gamers in Atlanta, which I think had significant impact on getting to that massive record voter turnout. Can I throw a question in there too, since we're, we're, our minds are on Georgia? What do you expect is gonna happen in the next, what, three, two and a half, three months down in Georgia? There are two Senate races that will, the results of which will determine who controls the Senate. Um, you've got obviously a pretty strong ground game down there right now. What what are I know in the circles that you run in? What do you expect to see? Well, first of all, I think we can get ready to see the most expensive Senate races we have ever seen run in the history of this country. And I don't even know how to begin to feel about that. I feel like our dear Senator Feingold would be like turning over, <laughs> you know, in his on his mattress, right? Like he'd be like, "What is happening right now?" Um, and, and, and anyway, but like, I think that's the first thing to note. Um, I think the second thing to note is that there will be a lot of people who will be, you know, rushing into Georgia, potentially screwing everything up. And the message that we've heard from folks on the ground is like, send money, don't come, right? Stay away. Don't, don't, don't start targeting ads here. Don't like build your own strategy. Just give us the resources and get out of the way because we know what we're doing. And that message has been, you know, sort of shared both with Democrats like, you know, Speaker Pelosi who weighed in on this race all the way to, you know, grassroots organizers like my network um, where people are like, we got this, we, we know what we're doing. Um, and I think what we're going to see right now, we, we're seeing a major push for voters who are going to be um, eligible to vote by the runoff. Um, so people who are turning 18, by the last voter registration deadline. So we're seeing a big push for that. People are asking for folks to, you know, plug into those text programs to contact those voters. Um, we're also gonna see a lot of cases around voter participation, absentee balloting, 
you know, all, they were going to see a lot of tricks, um, polling places being closed, um, and targeting these counties that had um, above 100% voter turnout, right? They're going to be targeting these counties pretty uh, hardcore. And then I think the last thing we'll see is, um, and somebody brought this up, uh, this is a question of sort of like turnout. And, and on, there was record turnout on all sides. And it just so happened, you know, that um, voters who, who prefer Joe Biden may have squeaked out in Georgia, right? But this gives folks an opportunity to go back um, and, you know, any part of, you know, any suburban areas, any rural areas, they, they will also leave no uh, stone unturned on the other side. And so we're going to see a massive sort of like push to register folks all over the political spectrum. And then we're going to just, you know, be inundated, I think, with, um, you know, political ads, like of all kinds of spectrum, a lot of misinformation, um, I think will will start being thrown to Georgia's way. And you know, here's another fun thing is even though neither of the candidates um, on any, you know, running on either side actually support defunding the police, I, I will guarantee you that we are going to see um, a barrage of uh, you know, Reverend Warnock and and uh, uh, Ossoff, uh, you know, support defunding the police and anarchy and you know, looting. And so we'll see sort of Will Willie Lynch kind of um ads run against both of those candidates on the issue of defund the police even though neither one of them actually supports um our campaign at this point <laughs> so um that was looking you know three months from now in the camp and uh an election three months from now moving forward to four years from now um phil asks uh, that donald trump remains the face of the GOP for the next four years? Um, do really any of you see any uh, rising stars in the GOP to challenge him within the next four years? And with that, um, you know, what that might mean for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or really for um, democracy, really? Um, yeah, so any rising stars in the Republican Party that could kind of counter Trump and Trumpism? Well, I don't, the question is what, what the question on whether or not they will counter Trumpism is a whole separate question. <laughs> um, and I think that really remains to be seen, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I think Nikki Haley is one to watch um, and uh, has the rather masterfully sort of split the line between sort of, you know, Tea Party slash Trumpism and um, you know, sort of traditional uh, good governance, right? Like, you know, sort of republicanism. And so I think she is definitely one to watch. My, my sense is, is that if Trump ru does run in 2024, it, you know, whether it's him or it, it's one of his children, um, you know, it will, it will be for the purpose of disruption. So, you know, I think that it's unlikely he'll wage a third party um, race because that is less disruptive to the Republican process and unlikely to yield him the result that he wants or, or the attention he wants. So I think he will try to run again or one of his children as a Republican. And, you know, I think um, the risk to us is not, you know, whether he does that. The risk really is uh, if we don't change some of the material conditions for people's lives in the next two years, if we don't ease the suffering that is happening because of COVID and despite kind of what we, the sort of surface we see in, in the media, like the suffering is, is pretty unimaginable when you start talking to these families and the quarter, more than a quarter of a million people who have lost members of their families, what they're going through. And I, I do fear that, uh, you know, if we don't address that, that we could be putting ourselves, our country in a position of, uh, you know, sort of the rise of a much more competent authoritarian in, in you know, 2024. Um, and that's something for us to be really nervous about, especially as we see some of the GOP election results coming out of places like Florida with QAnon members and other, um, you know, severe conspiracy, Laura Bloomer and others, right, severe conspiracy theorists who are winning legitimate institutional roles in our government. I'm sorry, my voice keeps going out too. I feel like I've been talking nonstop for, I don't know, 10 days straight and it just keeps 
Like sometimes it's here, sometimes it's not, but we'll see. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to stop for you anytime yeah. soon, but. <laughs> um, uh, giving you a, a, a minute there, Jennifer, I kind of want to ask this next, next question to um, everyone that reported on uh, the election and reported on the polls. Um, this question, these questions are from Andy. What should Wisconsin do to improve the administration of its elections? Um, should it expand early voting? Uh, allow the counting of absentee ballots to begin before election day or anything else? Any thoughts on what could be changed to make this a, a better process? Jay, I can jump in briefly. I don't know if Karen is still on the call. Yes, yeah, she is. But Karen and I had a really great conversation earlier today on this topic. And I learned a lot about how Wisconsin um, evaluates and audits the results of its election. And Karen, please do correct me in the chat if I misstate because I'm still coming to grips with what you explained. But I learned that um, Wisconsin is a bit behind some other states in that it audits the number of ballots cast to ensure that that lines up with, with records, but not necessarily the results themselves. So um, Karen said that we're excellent at making sure that those numbers line up, but those numbers could be for the wrong candidate, hypothetically. So um, she put forth a, um, an idea of a system where we could um, take a sample size of the ballots cast and actually measure if the machine tabulated those correctly, if um, the correct candidates were chosen, and how that actually wouldn't be too cumbersome of a lift for municipalities across the state. So that's a really interesting thing to consider and one I know she's written a lot about. Um, but one other thing too is what you mentioned is um, allowing Wisconsin to count absentee ballots ahead of election day. As of now, I just looked at this because Michigan changed their laws. I believe we are one of six states that prohibits that. And sure enough, come election day, we're hearing groans from some of the very folks who didn't allow that to happen, that, that uh, vote counting is taking too long. And uh, of course, when you have this influx of absentee ballots, it's going to take until 4 a.m. for municipalities like Milwaukee. And really, when you compare us to other swing states that were in the same situation, we were very quick in our ballot counting, which is great. Um, but and, and this election was a really success in that regard. But I think that advocates across the state are really fighting to have the chance to, even as Claire Woodall Vogue, the head of the Milwaukee Election Commission said, even having the chance to open up the ballot and flatten it so that it doesn't get caught in the machine would save a lot of time. So you wouldn't even have to tabulate the votes, you could just flatten them. So yeah, certainly something they're vying for. I guess I would just also note that there's um, kind of a number of other like challenges um, in place. So right now there's a lawsuit um, still pending that would remove, I believe, 130,000 registered voters from the polls. Um, and that's been something that's been sort of pushed against for, I think, over a year now. Um, and so there's all these kind of like little incremental um, things in place in the Wisconsin voting system um, that seem to cumulatively amount to making voting harder. Um, early voting was truncated to two weeks. Um, even just simple things like I'm remembering sort of going to the polls and um, a number of people were showing up at their polling sites having first gone to their early polling site, um, you know, showing up to a shuttered library and then having no real means of figuring out where they were meant to go, um, poor signage coming out of the city, um, things like this. So these like little um, things that go on at a city, at a municipal level um, that can amount to um, really throwing off, you know, a handful of voters here, a handful of voters there. Um, and that amounts to sort of a, a less than perfect administration of an election. I see Karen is chiming in in the chat. Um, and if you'd like to unmute yourself, you're free to, to chime in. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. good. Um, yeah, I think elections administration could be improved in all sorts of ways. The post-election audits to the outcome confirming audits that could confirm the right winner, at least, to make sure the voting machines counted the votes at least that well is, is kind of, that's the biggie. 
But there's many other ways that Wisconsin do, could do a much better job just in evaluating and assessing our elections afterwards. I think some of the work you guys are doing with, you know, looking at the rates of absentee rejections and, and that sort of just, you know, just in, in any other industry, they'd think of it as just kind of routine quality assurance or routine assessment of performance. And, but because Wisconsin's elections are so decentralized and our local clerks, bless their hearts, they're well-meaning, but you know, they're not really trained professional managers and they need a lot more support and sort of push from voters and journalists in that area is to get more managerial about assessing their performance. Um, and then in, in the chat, I just added this thing about uh, the Elections Commission discussed a couple of years ago, possibly going for legislation that would allow people to insert ballots, you know, before the election directly into the tabulators, you know, more true early voting in Wisconsin that we don't have now. But one of the hangups with that is that they do need time to test the equipment and the software before every election. And it, it just gets it's a little complicated with, uh, you know, when can you program, when is the ballot finalized? When can you program the equipment? When can you get the ballots printed? When can you test them to make sure that the machines, these machines and this software can count those ballots? And the Allegheny County um, problem that Nora referred to briefly, that was, that's an instance of what can happen. And that wasn't very bad, you know, when you start distributing the ballots before you've tested the equipment or tested the ballots in the equipment. But if we had a case where people were inserting absentee ballots in directly into the voting machines and then they didn't push tabulate until election day and at that point became aware of a problem, that would be a disaster. So we, we have to resolve some of these software testing and pre-election tests before we go to move to counting the ballots before election day. It's solvable, but we just haven't done it yet and we have to be aware of it. Thank you, Karen. That's a uh, wonderful addition to this uh, conversation and uh, shows that not only are our panelists brilliant, but uh, everyone that is tuning in right now is uh, are, are pretty brilliant as well. So thank you for that, Karen. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I, I I guess we can we can wrap it up. But I I will ask one more question for all of the panelists and and for D as well, which is, you know, this was <laughs> this has been uh, an interesting year and an interesting election. What's next? You mean 2024? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, what's next, you know, D in, in particular, um, re reporting on future elections, reporting on pandemic, um, you know, any upcoming projects and, and then as well as uh, uh, Jennifer, you know, priorities for on the ground organizing, you know, outside of presidential elections. What's, what's on the horizon? So uh, I can speak for Wisconsin Watch. We were lucky enough to uh, be uh, granted some uh, funding to bring Nora and Anya on our staff and Sharon, who's also on this call. They are with, uh, they're funded by Vote Beat, which is this pop-up newsroom that essentially wanted to, you know, give small newsrooms like us some resources so that we could better cover the election administration. Again, we're not political reporters. We are looking at the mechanics of and the accessibility of and the, the goods and the bads and the uglies of voting. Um, and so we will continue to be looking at a variety of issues that have to do with how, how do we carry out these elections? How can we make them better? Eventually, I think we're going to do a good exam. I hope uh, my plan is for us to do an examination of the polarized nature of our state and figure out are there some of these things uh, over which we can find common ground. For example, I think the, the, the question about changing absentee voting and early absentee voting to make it a little smoother, um, that seems to have bipartisan support in the legislature. So we'll be looking at things along those lines as, over the next several months. I think we might also be seeing, you know, some um, challenges taking place here in Wisconsin that could have repercussions um, elsewhere, as 
uh, Jennifer said actually when I was interviewing her on election night, um, Wisconsin and Milwaukee are sort of bellwethers for the nation. And so I think sometimes, um, you know, if there's a, a battle to be fought here, it could take place in other battlegrounds. So um, I'm beginning to look into um, the question of faithless electors and whether um, the electors elected on election day um, are going to in fact um, elect the candidate that voters decided on um, or whether there might be sort of challenges in that way. Um, it's been floated by a lawmaker here in Wisconsin. Um, there are other states where that is not, not allowed um, like Wisconsin. Um, and so it's sort of this question of whether this thing that we haven't really seen before might take place. And I'm diving into the life cycle of a ballot, which is really exciting because I think, um, you know, I've, I've been a Wisconsin resident most of my life and I didn't know half of what I've learned through reporting this, which is kind of shameful, but I think a lot of folks are in that position as well. So um, I hope that through really a painstaking tracking process of looking whose hands your ballot is going into, what are the safeguards against fraud at each step, where can things go wrong, and really looking at when have things gone wrong, um, we can hopefully give a better picture of what happened in this election and ease some concerns that, that folks have. And we're also going to be diving into, you know, uh, very small hypotheticals and things that I, I suppose have happened in, in small numbers, uh, such as what happens if a voter dies after they cast their ballot? Um, and what happens if we move up uh, the day where we can start processing absentee ballots in the state? So diving into some of those, some of those things that we've already touched on. And also, uh, so good that that you all are <laughs> that this is what you're working on. Good, okay, I like to hear it. Um, you know, for our part, we're still waiting on the official peaceful transfer of power. So we're gonna, you know, be vigilantly paying attention and defending and guarding our votes until the moment that happens. But we fully believe our democracy will survive this moment, and we want to help make sure that happens. I will say that you know, I think the most important thing. Um, you know, for the next incoming administration to tackle will be COVID relief. Um, again, I cannot stress this enough, but uh, we are the only outlier in the world out of the industrialized nations that has not guaranteed some amount of income to their citizens during this pandemic. And our results and what we're witnessing in terms of the trauma, pain and harm um, and deaths in our community, um, you know, uh, bear that forward. So uh, the next administration will need to negotiate a multi-trillion dollar bill and we want to be really, really clear that that money goes to people who are struggling in need and goes to our cities and counties to prevent them from going bankrupt. It goes to our hospitals to uh, increase their ability to in capacity to care. Uh, so that will be the thing we're most focused on. But I think the other thing that all of us will, you know, all the, the collective we and the democracy will need to focus on is, you know, the institutions of government, the agencies have been really hollowed out over the last four years, from the Department of Justice to the EPA to the Housing Authority and Administration um, uh, to the Department of Education. And so, you know, I think we, I, I believe that Joe Biden is very serious when he says he wants to unify the country um, and be, a, you know, a president for everyone. He's more serious than I would like him to be <laughs> for my own political leanings, but I believe that to be the case. And I'm really hoping that the sort of rebulking of our administrative agencies that provide such dire support to, you know, red and blue communities alike, right? Um, could be something that we sort of unify around as a country um, and we have the ability to kind of restock, restaff those agencies and start getting people to have good government services working for them again. Um, and I think that will do a lot to sort of reduce and, and defan the flames of division that have been, you know, raised, the stakes have been raised so high over the last eight years. And also, just very briefly, I think it'd be fair to say that in 2021, um, in answer to Jay's question, um, Wisconsin Watch will be digging into the census, uh, who gets counted and who doesn't. Um, and then, of course, uh, one of the major things that's used for redistricting um, attempts at gerrymandering. Um, and then the political process uh, begins anew, and we'll keep watching it.
And I think that is a great place to end. Uh, we have a lot to look forward to, uh, if you want to put it that way. Um, <laughs> thank you all for uh, attending this virtual event. And uh, thank you to, thank you to um, Dee for leading the conversation and as well as Dee Hall, as well as um, all of our uh, panelists, Nora Eckert, Van Vanessa Swales, Anya Van Wagdendonk and Jennifer Epps Addison. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us today and thank you for this great discussion. Thanks everybody. Good night everybody. Good night.